Welcome to Classic Paranormal, where we bring you true stories of the weird, strange, and otherworldly from works of literature from the past that time forgot. Don't forget to hit the share button to help promote this podcast. In this fourth episode, you will be entertained by Elsa Barker's Letters from a Living Dead Man, first published in 1919. Letter 38. Where Time Is Not. I think you now understand from what I have said that not all the souls who have passed the airy frontier are either in heaven or hell. Few reach an extreme, and most live out their allotted period here as they lived out their allotted period on Earth, without realizing either the possibilities or the significance of their condition. Wisdom is a tree of slow growth. The rings around its trunk are earthly lives, and the grooves between are the periods between the lives. Who grieves that an acorn is slow in becoming an oak? It is equally unphilosophical to feel that the truth which I have endeavored to make you understand, the truth of the soul's great leisure, is necessarily sad. If a man were to become an archangel in a few years' time, he would suffer terribly from growing pains. The law is implacable, but it often seems to be kind. Nevertheless, there are many souls in heaven, and there are many heavens of which I have seen a few. But do not fancy that most people go from place to place and from state to state as I do. The things which I describe to you are not exceptional, but that one man should be able to see and describe so many things is exceptional indeed. I owe it largely to the teacher. Without his guidance, I could not have acquired so rich an experience. Yes, there are many heavens. Last night I felt the yearning for beauty which sometimes came to me on earth. One of the strangest phenomena of this ethereal world is the tremendous attraction by sympathy. The attraction of events, I mean. Desire a thing intensely enough, and you are on the way to it. A body of a feather's weight moves swiftly when propelled by a free will. I felt a yearning for beauty which is synonymous for heaven. Did I really move from my place, or did heaven come to me? I cannot say, space means so little here. We desire a place, and we are there. Perhaps the teacher could give you a scientific explanation of this, but I cannot at the moment. And then I want to tell you about the heaven where I was last night. It was so beautiful that the charm of it is over me still. I saw a double row of dark top trees like cypresses, and at the end of this long avenue down which I passed was a softly diffused light. Somewhere I have read of a heaven lighted by a thousand suns, but my heaven was not like that. The light as I approached it was softer than moonlight, though clearer. Perhaps the light of the sun would shine as softly if seen through many veils of alabaster. Yet this light seemed to have come from nowhere. It simply was. As I approached, I saw two beings walking towards me, hand in hand. There was such a look of happiness on their faces as one never sees on the faces of earth. Only a spirit unconscious of time could look like that. I should say that these two were man and woman, save that they seemed so different from what you understand by man and woman. They did not even look at each other as they walked. The touch of the hand seemed to make them so much one that the realization of the eye could have added nothing to their content. Like the light which came from nowhere, they simply were. A little farther on, I saw a group of bright-robed children dancing among flowers. Hand in hand, in a ring they danced, and their garments, which were like the petals of flowers, moved with the rhythm of their dancing limbs. A great joy filled my heart. They too were unconscious of time and might have been dancing there from eternity for all I know. But whether their gladness was of the moment or of the ages had no significance for me or for them. Like the light and the lovers who had passed me hand in hand, they were. And that was enough. I had left the avenue of cypresses and stood in a wide plain encircled by a forest of blossoming trees. The odors of spring were on the air and birds sang. In the center of the plain, a great circular fountain played with the waters, tossing them in the air once they descended in feathery spray. An atmosphere of inexpressible charm was over everything. Here and there in this circular flower-scented heaven walked angelic beings, many or most of whom must sometime have been human. Two by two they walked, or in groups, smiling to themselves or at one another. On earth you often use the word peace, but compared with the peace of that place, the greatest peace of earth is only turmoil. I realized that I was in one of the fairest heavens, but that I was alone there. No sooner had this thought of solitude found lodgment in my heart than I saw standing before me the beautiful being about whom I wrote you a little time ago. It smiled and said to me, he who is sadly conscious of his solitude is no longer in heaven, so I've come to hold you here yet a little while. Is this the particular heaven where you dwell, I asked? Oh, I dwell nowhere and everywhere, the beautiful being answered. I am one of the voluntary wanderers who find the charm of home in every heavenly or earthly place. So you sometimes visit earth? Yes, even the remotest hells I go to, but I never stay there long. My purpose is to know all things, and yet to remain unattached. And do you love the earth? The earth is one of my playgrounds. I sing to the children of earth sometimes. And when I sing to the poets, they believe that their muse is with them. 
Here is the song which I sang one night to a soul which dwells among men. My sister, I am often with you when you realize it not. For me a poet soul is a well of water in whose deeps I can see myself reflected. I live in a glamour of light and colour which you mortal poets vainly try to express in magic words. I am in the sunset and in the star. I watch the moon grow old and you grow young. In childhood you sought for me in the swiftly moving cloud. In maturity you fancied you would caught me in the gleam of a lover's eye. But I am the eluder of men. I beckon and I fly, and the touch of my feet does not press down the heads of the blossoming daisies. You can find me and lose me again, for mortal cannot hold me. I am nearest to those who seek beauty, whether in thought or in form. I fly from those who seek to imprison me. You can come each day to the region where I dwell. Sometimes you will meet me, sometimes not. For my will is the wind's will, and I answer no beckoning finger. But when I beckon, the souls come flying from the four corners of heaven. Your soul comes flying too, for you are one of those I have called by the spell of my magic. I have use for you, and you have meaning for me. I like to see your soul in its hours of dream and ecstasy. Whenever one of my own dreams a dream of paradise, the light grows brighter for me, to whom all things are bright. Oh, forget not the charm of the moment, forget not the lure of the mood, for the mood is wiser than the magi of earth, and the treasures of the moment are richer and rarer than the hoarded wealth of the ages. The moment is real, while the age is only a delusion, a memory, a shadow. Be sure that each moment is all, and that the moment is more than time. Time carries an hourglass, and his step is slow. His hair is white from the rhyme of years, and his scythe is dull with unwearied mowing. But he never yet has caught the moment in its flight. He has grown old and casting nets for it. Ah, the magic of life, and of the endless combination of living things. I was young when the sun was formed, and I shall be young when the moon falls dead in the arms of her daughter, the earth. Will you not be young with me? The dust is as nothing, the soul is all. Like a crescent moon on the surface of a lake's water is the moment of love's awakening. Like a faded flower in the lap of the tired world is the moment of love's death. But there is love, and love. And the love of the light for its radiance is the love of souls for each other. There is no death where the inner light shines, irradiating the fields of the within, the beyond, the unattainable attainment. You know where to find me. Letter 39. The Doctrine of Death. Many times during the months in which I have been here, I have seen men and women lying in a state of unconsciousness more profound than the deepest sleep, their faces expressionless and uninteresting. At first, before I understood the nature of their sleep, I tried an experiment to awaken one or two of them and was not successful. In certain cases where my curiosity was aroused, I have returned later day after day and found them still lying in the same lethargy. Why, I asked myself, should any man sleep like that, a sleep so deep that neither the spoken word nor the physical touch could arouse him? One day when the teacher was with me, we passed one of those unconscious men whom I had seen before, had watched, and had striven unsuccessfully to arouse. Who are these people who sleep like that, I asked the teacher, and he replied, they are those who in their earth life deny the immortality of the soul after death. How terrible, I said. And will they never awaken? Yes, perhaps centuries, perhaps ages hence, when the irresistible law of rhythm shall draw them out of their sleep into incarnation. For the law of rebirth is one of the law of rhythm. Would it not be possible to awaken one of them, this man, for instance? You have attempted it, have you not? The teacher inquired with a keen look into my face. Yes, I admitted. And you failed? Yes. We looked at each other for a moment, then I said, Perhaps you with your greater power and knowledge could succeed where I have failed. He made no answer. His silence fired my interest still farther, and I said eagerly, Will you not try? Will you not awaken this man? You know not what you ask, he replied. But tell me this, I demanded. Could you awaken him? Perhaps. But in order to counteract the law which holds him in sleep, the law of the spell he laid upon his own soul when he went out of life demanding unconsciousness and annihilation, in order to counteract that law, I should have to put in operation a law still stronger. And that is, I asked, Will, he answered, the potency of will. Could you? As I said before, perhaps. And will you? Again, I say that you know not what you ask. Will you please explain, I persisted. For indeed, this seems to me to be one of the most marvelous things which I have seen. The face of the teacher was very grave as he answered. What good has this man done in the past that I should place myself between him and the law of cause and effect which he has willfully set in operation? I do not know his past, I said. Then, the teacher demanded, will you tell me your reason for asking me to do this thing? My reason? Yes. Is it a pity for this man's unfortunate condition, or is it scientific curiosity on your part? 
I should gladly have been able to say that it was pity for the man's sad state which moved me so, but one does not juggle with truth or with motives when speaking to such a teacher. So I admitted that it was scientific curiosity. In that case, he said, I am justified in using him as a demonstration of the power of trained will. It will not harm him, will it? On the contrary, and though he may suffer shock, it will probably be the means of so impressing his mind that never again, even in future lives on earth, can he believe himself or teach others to believe that death ends everything. As far as he is concerned, he does not deserve that I should waste upon him so great an amount of energy as will be necessary to arouse him from this sleep, this spell which he laid upon himself ages ago. But if I awaken him, it will be for your sake, that you may believe. I wish I could describe the scene which took place so that you could see it with the eyes of your imagination. There lay the man at our feet, his face colorless and expressionless, and above him towered the splendid form of the teacher, his face beautiful with power, his eyes brilliant with thought. Can you not see, asked the teacher, a faint light surrounding the seemingly lifeless figure? Yes, but the light is very faint indeed. Nevertheless, said the teacher, that light is far less faint than is the weak soul's hold upon the eternal truth. But where you see only a pale light around the recumbent form, I see in that light many pictures of the soul's past. I see that he not only denied the immortality of the soul's consciousness, but that he taught his doctrine of death to other men and made them even as himself. Truly, he does not deserve that I should try to awaken him. Yes, but will you do it? Yes, I will do it. I regret that I am not permitted to tell you by what form of words and by what acts my teacher succeeded after a mighty effort in arousing that man from his self-imposed imitation of annihilation. I realized as never before not only the personal power of the teacher, but the irresistible power of a trained and directed will. I thought of that scene recorded in the New Testament where Jesus said to the dead man in the tomb, Lazarus, come forth. The soul of man is immortal, declared the teacher, looking fixedly into the shrinking eyes of the awakened man and holding them by his will. The soul of man is immortal, he repeated. Then in a tone of command, stand up. The man struggled to his feet. Though his body was light as a feather, as are all our bodies here, I could see that his slumbering energy was still almost too dormant to permit of that really slight exertion. You live, declared the teacher. You have passed through death, and you live. Do not dare to deny that you live. You cannot deny it. But I do not believe, began the man, his stubborn materialism still challenging the truth of his own existence, his memory surviving the ordeal through which he had passed. This last surprised me more than anything else. But after a moment's stupefaction, I understood that it was the power of the teacher's mental picture of the astral records round this soul which had forced those memories to awaken. Sit down between us two, said the teacher to the newly aroused man, and let us reason together. You thought yourself a great reasoner, did you not, when you walked the earth as so and so? I did. You see that you were mistaken in your reasoning, the teacher went on, for you certainly passed through death and you are now alive. But where am I? He looked about him in a bewildered way. Where am I and who are you? You are an eternity, replied the teacher, where you always have been and always will be. And you? I am one who knows the workings of the law. What law? The law of rhythm, which drives the soul into and out of gross matter as it drives the tides of the ocean into flood and ebb and the consciousness of man into sleeping and waking. And it was you who awakened me? Are you then this law of rhythm? The teacher smiled. I am not the law, he said, but I am bound by it even as you, save as I am temporarily able to transcend it by my will. Again, even as you. I caught my breath at the profundity of this simple answer, but the man seemed not to observe its significance. Even as he. Why, this man, by his misdirected will, had been able temporarily to transcend the law of immortality, even as the teacher, by his wisely directed will, transcended the mortal in himself. My soul sang within me at this glimpse of the godlike possibilities of the human mind. How long have I been asleep? demanded the man. In what year did you die? the teacher asked. In the year 1817. And the present year is known, according to the Christian calendar, as the year 1912. You have lain in a death-like sleep for 95 years. And was it really you who awakened me? Yes. Why did you do it? Because it suited my good purpose, was the teacher's rather stern reply. It was not because you deserved to be awakened. And how long would I have slept if you had not aroused me? I cannot say. Probably until those who had started even with you had left you far behind on the road of evolving life. Perhaps for centuries. Perhaps for ages. You have taken a responsibility upon yourself, said the man. You do not need to remind me of that, replied the teacher. I weighed in my own mind the full responsibility and decided to assume it for a purpose of my own, for will is free. Yet you overpowered my will. I did, but by my own more potent will, more potent because wisely directed and backed by a greater energy. 
And what are you going to do with me? I'm going to assume the responsibility of your training. My training? Yes. And you will make things easy for me? On the contrary, I shall make things very hard for you. But you cannot escape my teaching. Shall you instruct me personally? Personally in the sense that I shall place you under the instruction of an advanced pupil of my own. Who, this man here? He pointed to me. No, he is better occupied. I will take you to your teacher presently. And what will he show me? The panorama of immortality. And when you have learned the lesson so that you can never forget nor escape it, you will have to go back to the earth and teach it to others. You will have to convert as many men to the truth of immortality as you have in the past deluded and misled by your false doctrines of materialism and death. And what if I refuse? You have said the will is free. Do you refuse? No, but what if I had? Then instead of growing and developing under the law of action and reaction, which in the East they call karma, you would have been its victim. I do not understand you. He is indeed a wise man, said the teacher, who understands the law of karma, which is also the law of cause and effect. But come, I will now take you to your new instructor. Then, leaving me alone, the teacher and his charge disappeared in the great distance. I remained there a long time, pondering what I had seen and heard. Letter 40 The Celestial Hierarchy I am about to say something which may shock certain persons. But those who are too fond of their own ideas without being willing to grant others their ideas in turn should not seek to open the jealously guarded doors which separate the land of the so-called living from the land of the certainly not dead. This is a statement which I have to make, that there are many gods and that the one god is the sum total of all of them. All gods exist in God. Do what you like with that statement, dear world, for truth is more vital than anybody's dream, even yours or mine. Have I seen God? I have seen him who has been called the Son of God, and you may remember that he said that whoever has seen the Son had seen the Father. But what are the other gods, you ask? For there are many in the world's pantheons. Well, the realities exist out here. What, you say again, can man create the gods of his imagination and give them a place in the invisible? No, they existed here first, and man became aware of them long before through his own psychic and spiritual perception of them. Man did not create them, and the materialists who say that he did know little of the laws of being. Man, primitive man, perceived them through his own spiritual affinities with and nearness to them. When you have read folk tales of this god and that, you have perhaps spoken patronizingly of the old myth-makers and thanked your lucky stars that you lived in a more enlightened age. But those old storytellers were the really enlightened ones, for they saw into the other world and recorded what they saw. Many of the world's favorite gods are said to have lived upon the earth as men. They have so lived. Does that startle you? How does a man become a god, and how does a god become a man? Have you ever wondered? A man becomes a god by developing god consciousness, which is not the same as developing his own thought about god. During recent years, you have heard and read much of so-called masters, men of superhuman attainments who have foregone the small pleasures and recognition of the world in order to achieve something greater. Man's ideas of the gods change as the gods themselves change. For everything is becoming, as Heraclitus said about 24 centuries ago. Did you fancy that the gods stood still and that only you progressed? In that case, you might someday outstrip your god and fall to worshipping yourself, having nothing to look up to as superior. Accompanied by the teacher, I have stood face to face with some of the older gods. Had I come out here with a superior contempt for all gods save my own, I should hardly have been granted that privilege. For the gods are as exclusive as they are inclusive, and they only reveal themselves to those who can see them as they are. Does this open the door to polytheism, pantheism, or other dreaded isms? An ism is only a word. Facts are. The day has passed when men are burned at the stake for having had a vision of the wrong god. But even now I would hesitate to tell all that I have learned about the gods, though I can tell you much. Take, for instance, the god whom the Romans called Neptune. Did you fancy that he was only a poetic creation of the old myth-makers? He was something more than that. He was supposed to rule the ocean. Now, what could be more orderly and inevitable than that the work of controlling the elements in the flood should be assumed by and the work parceled out among those able to perform it? We hear much of the laws of nature. Who enforces them? The term natural law is in every man's mouth, but the law is executors in heaven as on earth. I have been told that there are also planetary beings, planetary gods, though I have never had the honor of conscious communion with one of them. If a planetary being is so far beyond the daring of my approach, how should I comport myself in approaching the god of gods? O paradoxical mind of man, which stands in awe and trembling before the servant, yet approaches the master without fear. I have been told that the guardian spirit of this planet, Earth, evolved himself into a god of tremendous power and responsibility in bygone cycles of existence. 
To him who has never used a microscope, the idea need not be appalling. The infinitely small and the infinitely great are the tail and the head of the eternal serpent. Who do you fancy will be the gods of the future cycles of existence? Will they not be those who in this cycle of planetary life have raised themselves above the mortal? Will they not be the strongest and most sublime among the present spirits of men? Even the gods must have their resting period, and those in office now would doubtless wish to be supplanted. To those men who are ambitious for growth, the doors of development are always open. Letter 41. The Darling of the Unseen. I've written you before of one whom I call the beautiful being, one whose province seems to be the universe, whose chosen companions are all men and angel kind, whose playthings are days and ages. For some reason, the beautiful being has lately been so gracious as to take an interest in my efforts to acquire knowledge and has shown me many things which otherwise I should never have seen. When a tour of the planet is personally conducted by an angel, the traveler is specially favored. Letters of introduction to the great and powerful of Earth are nothing compared with this introduction, for by its means I see into the souls of all beings, and my visits to their houses are not limited to the drawing rooms. The beautiful being has access everywhere. Did you ever fancy when you had had a lovely dream that maybe an angel had kissed you in your sleep? I have seen such things. Oh, do not be afraid of giving rein to your imagination. It is the wonderful things which are really true. The commonplace things are nearly all false. When a great thought lifts you by the hair, do not cling hold of the solid earth. Let go. He whom an inspiration seizes might even, if he dared to trust his vision, behold the beautiful being face to face as I have. When flying through the air, one's sight is keen. If one goes fast and high enough, one may behold the inconceivable. The other night I was meditating on a flower seed, for there is nothing so small that it may not contain a world. I was meditating on a flower seed and amusing myself by tracing its history, generation by generation, back to the dawn of time. I smile as I use that figure, the dawn of time. For time has had so many dawns and so many sunsets, and still it is unwearied. I trace the genealogy of the seed back to the time when the caveman forgot his fighting and the strangely disturbing pleasure of smelling the fragrance of its parent flower, when I heard a low musical laugh in my left ear, and something as light as a butterfly's wing brushed my cheek on that side. I turned to look, and quick as a flash I heard the laughter in the other ear, while another butterfly touch came on my right cheek. Then something like a veil was blown across my eyes, and a clear voice said, Guess who it is? I was all a thrill with the pleasure of this divine play, and I answered, Perhaps you were the fairy that makes blind children dream of daisy fields. However did you know me, laughed the beautiful being, unwinding the veil from my eyes. I am indeed that fairy. But you must have been peeping through the cracks in the door when I touched the eyes of the blind babies. I am always peeping through the cracks in the door of the earth people's chamber, I replied. The beautiful being laughed again. Will you come and have another peep with me this evening? With pleasure. You could not do it with pain if I were by, was the response. And we started then and there upon the strangest evening's rounds which I have ever made. We began by going to the house of a friend of mine and standing quietly in the room where he and his family were at supper. No one saw us but the cat, which began a loud purring and stretching itself with joy at our presence. Had I gone there alone, the cat might have been afraid of me. But who, even a cat, could fear the beautiful being? Suddenly one of the children, the youngest one, looked up from his supper of bread and milk and said, Father, why does milk taste good? I really do not know, admitted the author of his being, perhaps because the cow enjoyed giving it. That father might have been a poet, the beautiful being said to me, but no one overheard the remark. One of the other children complained of feeling sleepy and put his head down on the edge of the table. The mother started to arouse him, but the beautiful being fluttered a mystifying veil before her eyes and she could not do it. Let him sleep if he wants to, she said. I will put him to bed by and by. I could see in the brain of the child that he was dreaming already, and I knew that the beautiful being was weaving a fairy tale on the web of his mind. After only a moment, he started up wide awake. I dreamed, he said, that the writer of these letters was standing over there and smiling at me as he used to smile, and with him was an angel. I never saw an angel before. Come away, whispered the beautiful being to me. From dreaming children, nothing can be hidden. We then paid a visit to the future mother of my boy Lionel, O oh, mystery of maternity. The eyes of the beautiful being were like stars as we gazed upon this flower seed whose genealogy goes even beyond the days of the caveman. Aye, back to the time of the fire mist and the suns of the morning stars. Come away, said the beautiful being again. To brides who dream of motherhood, much also is revealed. And for this evening, we remain unknown. We passed along the margin of a river which divides a busy town. Suddenly, from a house by the riverbank, we heard the tinkle of a guitar and a woman's sweet voice singing. When other lips and other hearts their tale of love shall tell, then you'll remember, you'll remember me. The beautiful being touched my hand and whispered, 
The life that is so sweet to these mortals is a book of enchantment for me. Yet you have never tasted human life yourself. On the contrary, I taste it every day. But I only taste it and pass on. Should I consume it, I might not be able to pass on. But do you never long so to consume it? Oh, but the thrill is in the taste. Digestion is a more or less tiresome process. I fear you are a divine wanton, I said affectionately. Be careful, answered the beautiful being. He who fears anything will lose me in the fog of his own fears. You irresistible one, I cried. Who are you? What are you? Did you not say yourself a little while ago that I was the fairy who made blind babies dream of daisy fields? I love you, I said, with an incomprehensible love. All love is incomprehensible, the beautiful being answered. But come, brother, let us climb the hill of vision. When you are out of breath, if you catch up my flying veil, I will wait till you are rested. Strange things we saw that night. I should weary you if I told you all of them. We stood on the crater of an active volcano and watched the dance of the fire spirits. Did you fancy that salamanders were only seen by unabstemious poets? They are as real to themselves and to those who see them as are the omnibus drivers in the streets of London. The real and the unreal. If I were writing an essay now instead of the narrative of a traveler in a strange country, I should have much to say on the subject of the real and the unreal. The beautiful being has changed my ideas about the whole universe. I wonder if when I come back to the earth again I shall remember all the marvels I have seen. Perhaps, like most people, I shall have forgotten the details of my life before birth, and shall bring with me only vague yearnings after the inexpressible and the deep unalterable conviction that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in the philosophy of the world's people. Perhaps if I almost remember, but not quite, I shall be a poet in my next life. Worse things might happen to me. What an adventure it is, this launching of one's bark upon the sea of rebirth. But by my digressions one would say that I was in my second childhood. So I am, my second childhood in the so-called invisible. When, on my voyage that night with the beautiful being, I had feasted my eyes upon beauty until they were weary, my companion led me to scenes on the earth which had I beheld them alone would have made me very sad. But no one can be sad when the beautiful being is near. That is the charm of that marvelous entity. To be in its presence is to taste the joys of immortal life. We looked on at a midnight revel in what you on earth would call a haunt of vice. Was I shocked and horrified? Not at all. I watched the antics of those human animalculae as a scientist might watch the motions of the smaller living creatures in a drop of water. It seemed to me that I saw it all from the viewpoint of the stars. I started to say from the viewpoint of God to whom small and great are the same. But perhaps the stellar simile is the truer one, for how can we judge of what God sees, unless we mean the God in us? You who read what I have written, perhaps when you come out here you will have many surprises. The small things may seem larger, and the large things smaller, and everything may take its proper place in the infinite plan of which even your troubles and perplexities are parts, inevitable and beautiful. That idea came to me as I wandered from heaven to earth, from beauty to ugliness, with my angelic companion. I wish I could explain the influence of the beautiful being. It is unlike anything else in the universe. It is elusive as a moonbeam, yet more sympathetic than a mother. It is daintier than a rose, yet it looks upon ugly things with a smile. It is purer than the breath of the sea, yet it seems to have no horror of impurity. It is artless as a child, yet wiser than the ancient gods. A marvel of paradoxes, a celestial vagabond, the darling of the unseen. Letter 42. A Victim of the Non-Existent The other day I met an acquaintance, a woman whom I had known for a number of years and who came out about the time I did. Old acquaintances when they meet here greet each other about as they did on earth. Though we are, as a rule, less conventional than you, still we cling more or less to our former habits. I asked Mrs. Blank how she was enjoying herself and she said that she was not having a very pleasant time. She found that everybody was interested in something else and did not want to talk with her. This was the first time I had met with such a complaint and I was struck by its peculiarity. I asked her to what cause she attributed the unsociability and she replied that she did not know the cause, that it had puzzled her. What do you talk to them about, I asked. Why, I tell them my troubles as one friend tells another, but they do not seem to be interested. How selfish people are. Poor soul, she did not realize here any more than she had on earth that our troubles are not interesting to anybody but ourselves. Suppose I say that you unburden yourself to me. Tell me your troubles, I promise not to run away. Why, I hardly know where to begin, she answered. I have found so many unpleasant things. What, for instance? Why, horrid people. I remember that when I lived in X, I sometimes told myself that in the other world I would not be bothered with boarding house landladies and their careless hired girls, but they are just as bad here, even worse. Do you mean to tell me that you live in a boarding house here? Where should I live? You know that I am not rich. 
Of all the astonishing things I had heard in this land of changes, this was the most astonishing. A boarding house in the invisible world? Surely, I told myself, my observations had been limited. Here was a new discovery. Is the table good in your boarding house? I asked. No, it is worse than at the last one. Are the meals scanty? Yes, scanty and bad, especially the coffee. Will you tell me, I said, my wonder growing, if you really eat three meals a day here as you used to do on earth? How strangely you talk, she answered in a sharp tone. I don't find very much difference between this place and the earth as you call it, except that I am more uncomfortable here because everything is so flighty and uncertain. Yes, go on. I never know in the morning who will be sitting next to me in the evening. They come and go. And what do you eat? The same old things, meat and potatoes and pies and puddings. And you still eat these things? Why, yes, don't you? I hardly knew how to reply. Had I told her what my life here really was, she would no more have understood than she would have understood two years ago when we lived in the same city on earth. Had I told her then what my real mental life was. So I said, I have not much appetite. She looked at me as if she distrusted me in some way, though why I could not say. Are you still interested in philosophy, she asked. Yes, perhaps that is why I don't get hungry very often. You were always a strange man. I suppose so, but tell me, Mrs. Blank. Do you never feel a desire to leave all this behind? To leave all what behind? Why, boarding houses and uncongenial people, and meat and potatoes and pies and puddings and the shadows of material things in general. What do you mean by the shadows of material things? I mean that these viands and pastries which you eat and do not enjoy are not real. They have no real existence. Why, she exclaimed, have you become a Christian scientist? At this I laughed heartily. Was one who denied the reality of astral food in the astral world a Christian scientist because the Christian scientists denied the reality of material food in the material world? The analogy tickled my fancy. Let me convert you to Christian science then, I said. No, sir, was her sharp response. You never succeeded in convincing me that there was any truth in your various fads and philosophies, and now you tell me that the food I eat is not real. I puzzled for a moment, trying to find a way by which the actual facts of her condition could be brought home to the mind of this poor woman. Finally, I hit upon the right track. Do you realize I said that you were only dreaming? What? She snapped at me. Yes, you were dreaming. All this is a dream, these boarding houses, etc. If that is so, perhaps you would like to wake me up. I certainly should, but you will have to awaken yourself, I fancy. Tell me, what were your ideas about the future life before you came out here? What do you mean by out here? Why, before you died? But man, I'm not dead. Of course you're not dead. Nobody is dead. But you certainly understand that you have changed your condition. Yes, I have noticed a change, and a change for the worse. Do you remember your last illness? Yes. And that you passed out? Yes, if you call it that. You know that you have left your body. She looked down at her form, which appeared as usual, even to its rusty black dress rather out of date. But I still have my body, she said. Then you have not missed the other one? No. And you do not know where it is. My amazement was growing deeper and deeper. Here was a phenomenon I had not met before. I suppose, she said, they must have buried my body if you say I left it. But this one is just the same to me. Has it always seemed the same, I asked, remembering my own experience when I first came out, my difficulty in adjusting the amount of energy I used to the lightness of my new body. Now you mention it, she said, I do recall having some trouble a year or two ago. I was quite confused for a long time. I think I must have been delirious. Yes, doubtless you were, I answered. But tell me, Mrs. Blank, have you no desire to visit heaven? Why, I always supposed that I should visit heaven when I died. But as you see, I am not dead. Still, I said, I could take you to heaven now, perhaps, if you would like to go. Are you joking? Not at all. Will you come? Are you certain that I can go there without dying? But I assure you, there are no dead. As we went slowly along, for I thought it best not to hurry her too swiftly from one condition to another, I drew a word picture of the place we were about to visit. The Orthodox Christian Heaven. I described the happy and loving people who stood in the presence of their Savior and the soft radiance from the central light. Perhaps, I said, some dwellers in that country see the face of God himself as they expected to see it when they were on earth. As for myself, I saw only the light, and afterwards the figure of the Christ. I have often wished to see Christ, said my companion in an awestruck voice. Do you think that I can really see him? I think so, if you believe strongly that you will. And what were they doing in heaven when you were there, she asked. They were worshipping God, and they were happy. I want to be happy, she said. I have never been very happy. The great thing in heaven, I advised, is to love all the others. That is what makes them happy. If they loved the face of God only, it would not be quite heaven, for the joy of God is the joy of union. Thus, by subtle stages, I led her mind away from astral boarding houses to the ideas of the orthodox spiritual world, which was probably the only spiritual world which she could understand. 
I spoke of the music, yes, church music if you like to call it that. I created in her wandering and chaotic mind a fixed desire for Sabbath joys and Sabbath peace and the communion of friends in heaven. But for this gradual preparation, she could not have adjusted herself to the conditions of that world. When we stood in the presence of those who worship God with song and praise, she seemed caught up on a wave of enthusiasm to feel that at last she had come home. I wanted to take leave of her in such a way that she would not come out again to look for me, so I held out my hand in the old way and said goodbye, promising to come again and visit her there and advising her to stay where she was. I think she will. Heaven has a strong hold on those who yield themselves to its beauty. Letter 43 A Cloud of Witnesses Are you surprised to learn that there is even a greater difference between the beings in this world than between the people of Earth? That is inevitable, for this is a freer world than yours. I should fail in my duty if I did not tell you something of the evil beings out here. Perhaps no one else will ever tell you, and the knowledge is necessary to self-protection. First, I want you to say that there is a strong sympathy between the spirits in this world and the spirits in your world. Yes, they are both spirits, the difference being mainly a difference in garments, one wearing fresh and the other wearing a subtler but nonetheless real body. Now, the good spirits, which may be the spirits of just men made perfect or those who merely aspire to perfection, are powerfully drawn to those fellow spirits on earth whose ideals are in harmony with their own. The magnetic attraction which exists between human beings is weak compared with that which is possible between beings embodied and beings disembodied. As opposites attract, the very difference in matter is a drawing force. The female is not more attractive to the male than the being of flesh is attractive to the being in the astral. The two do not usually understand each other, neither do man and woman. But the influence is felt, and beings out here understand its source better than you do, because they generally carry with them the memory of your world while you have lost the memory of theirs. At no time is the sympathetic power between men and spirits so strong as when men are laboring under some intense emotion, be it love or hate or anger or any other excitement. For then, the fiery element in man is most active, and spirits are attracted by fire. Here, the writing suddenly stopped, the influence passed to return after a few minutes. You wonder why I went away? It was in order to draw a wide protective circle around us both. For what I have to say to you is something which certain spirits would wish me to leave unsaid. To continue. When man is excited, exalted, or in any way intensified in his emotional life, the spirits draw near to him. That is how conception is possible. That is the secret of inspiration. That is why anger grows with what it feeds upon. And this last is the point which I want to drive home to your consciousness. When you lose your temper, you lose a great deal, among other things, the control of yourself, and it is barely possible that another entity may momentarily assume control of you. This subjective world, as I have called it, is full of hateful spirits. They love to stir up strife, both here and on earth. They enjoy the excitement of anger in others. They are thrilled by the poison of hatred. As certain men revel in morphine, so they revel in all inharmonious passion. Do you see the point in the danger? The small seed of anger in your heart they feed and inflame by the hatred in their own. It is not necessarily hatred of you as an individual, often they have no personal interest in you. But for the purpose of gratifying their evil passion, they will attach themselves to you temporarily. Other illustrations are not far to seek. A man who has the habit of anger, even of fault-finding, is certain to be surrounded by evil spirits. I have seen a score of them around a man, thrilling him with their own malignant magnetism, stirring him up again when by reaction he would have cooled down. Sometimes the impersonal interest in mere strife becomes personal. An angry spirit here may find that by attaching himself to a certain man, he is sure to get every day a thrill or thrills of angry excitement, as his victim continually loses his temper in storms and rages. This is one of the most terrible misfortunes that can happen to anybody. Carried to its ultimate, it may become obsession and end in insanity. The same law applies to other unlovely passions, those of lust and avarice. Beware of lust. Beware of all sex attraction into which spiritual or heart element enters. I have seen things which I would not wish to record, either through your hand or any other. Let us take instead a case of avarice. I have seen a miser counting over his gold, have seen the terrible eyes of the spirits which enjoyed the gold through him. For gold has a peculiar influence as a metal, apart from its purchasing power or the associations attached to it. Certain spirits love gold, even as the miser loves it, and with the same acquisitive astringent passion. As it is one of the heaviest metals, so its power is a condensed and condensing power. I do not mean by this that you should beware of gold. Get all you can use, for it is useful. But do not gloat over it. One does not attract the avaricious spirits merely by owning the symbols of wealth, houses and lands and stocks and bonds, or even a moderate amount of coin. But I advise you not to hoard coins to gloat over. There are certain jewels, however, whose possession will aid you, for they attract the spirits of power. But you will probably choose your jewels by reason of your affinity with them, and may choose wisely. 
Now that I have done my duty by warning you against the passions and the passionate spirits of which you should be aware, I can go on to speak of other feelings and of other spiritual associates of man. You have met persons who seem to radiate sunshine, whose very presence in a room made you happier. Have you asked yourself why? The true answer would be that by their lovely disposition they attracted round them a cloud of witnesses as to the joy and the beauty of life. I have myself often basked in the warm rays of a certain loving heart I know upon the earth. I have heard spirits say to one another as they crowded around that person, It is good to be here. Do you think that any evil thing could happen to him? A score of loving and sympathetic spirits would strive to give him warning should any evil threaten. Then too a joyous heart attracts joyous events. Simplicity also and sweet humility are very attractive to gentle disembodied souls. Except ye be as little children, ye cannot enter in. Have you not often seen a child enjoying himself with unseen playfellows? You would call them imaginary playfellows. Perhaps they were, perhaps they were not imaginary. To imagine may be to create, or it may be to attract things already created. I have seen the beautiful being itself more than once hovering in ecstasy above an earthly creature who was happy. A song of joy when it comes from a thrilling heart may attract a host of invisible beings who enjoy it with the singer. For as I have told you, sound carries from one world to another. Never weep, unless you must, to restore lost equilibrium. The weeping spirits, however, are rather harmless because they're weak. Sometimes a storm of tears, when it is past, clears the soul's atmosphere. But while the weeping is in progress, the atmosphere is thick with weeping spirits. One could almost hear the drip of their tears through the veil of ether, if the sobbing earthly one did not make much noise with his grief. Laugh and the world laughs with you may be true enough, but when you weep, you do not weep alone. Letter 44 The Kingdom Within There is one obscure point which I want to make clear, even though I may be accused of mysticism by those to whom mysticism means only obscurity. I have said that the life of man is both subjective and objective, but principally objective and that the life of spirits dwelling in subtle matter is both subjective and objective, but principally subjective. Yet I have spoken of going alone or with others to heaven as a place. I want to explain this. You remember the saying, the kingdom of heaven is within you, that is, subjective. Also, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst of them. Now those places in the subtle realm which I have called the Christian heavens are places where two or three, or two or three thousand, as the case may be, are gathered in his name to enjoy the kingdom of heaven within them. The aggregation of souls is subjective, that is, the souls exist in time and space. The heaven which they enjoy is subjective, though they may all see the same thing at the same time, as for instance the vision of him whom they adore as Redeemer. That is as clear as I can make it. Letter 45 The Game of Make-Believe One day I met a man in doublet and hose who announced to me that he was Shakespeare. Now I have become accustomed to such announcements, and they do not surprise me as they did six or eight months ago. Yes, I still keep account of your months for a purpose of my own. I asked this man what proof he could adduce of his extraordinary claim, and he answered that it needed no proof. That will not go down with me, I said, for I am an old lawyer. Thereupon he laughed and asked, Why did you not join in the game? I am telling you this rather senseless story because it illustrates an interesting point in regard to our life here. In a former letter, I wrote about my meeting with a newly arrived lady who, finding me dressed in a Roman toga, thought that I might be Caesar and that I told her we were all actors here. I meant that, like children, we dress up when we want to impress our own imagination or to relive some scene in the past. This playing of a part is usually quite innocent, though sometimes the very ease with which it is done brings with it the temptation to deception, especially in dealings with the earth people. You see the point I wish to make. The lying spirits of which the frequenters of seance room so often make complaint are these astral actors, who may even come to take a certain pride in the cleverness of their art. Be not too sure that the spirit who claims to be your deceased grandfather is that estimable old man himself. He may be merely an actor playing a part for his own entertainment and yours. How is one to tell, you ask? One cannot always tell. I should say, however, that the surest test of all would be the deep and unemotional conviction that the veritable entity was in one's presence. There is an instinct in the human heart which will never deceive us if we without fear or bias will yield ourselves to its decision. How often in worldly matters have we acted against the inner monitor and been deceived and led astray? If you have an instinctive feeling that a certain invisible or even visible entity is not what it claims to be, it is better to discontinue the conference. If it is the real person, and if he has anything vital to say, he will come again and again, for the so-called dead are very desirous to communicate with the living. As a rule, though, the play acting over here is innocent of intent to deceive. Most men desire occasionally to be something which they are not. 
the poor man who for one evening dresses himself in his best clothes and squanders a week's salary in playing the millionaire is moved by the same impulse which inspires the man in my story to assert that he was Shakespeare. The woman who always dresses beyond her means is playing the same little game with herself and with the world. All children know the game. They will tell you in a convinced tone that they are Napoleon Bonaparte or George Washington, and they feel hurt if you scoff. Perhaps my friend with the Shakespearean aspiration was an amateur dramatist when he was on earth. Had he been a professional dramatist, he would probably have stated his real name, more or less unknown, and followed it by the declaration that he was the well-known so-and-so. There is much pride out here in the accomplishments of the earth life, especially among those who have recently come out. This lessens with time, and after one has been long here, one's interests are likely to be more general. Men and women do not cease to be human merely by crossing the frontier of what you call the invisible world. In fact, the human characteristics are often exaggerated because the restraints are fewer. There are no penalties inflicted by the community for the personating of one man by another. It is not taken seriously, for to the clearer side of this world, the disguise is too transparent. Letter 46. Heirs of Hermes. There is much more sound sense and not a little nonsense talked about adepts and masters who live and work on the astral plane. Now I am myself living and sometimes working on the so-called astral plane, and what I say about the plane is the result of experience and not of theory. I have met adepts, yes, masters here. One of them especially has taught me much and has guided my footsteps from the first. Do not fear to believe in masters. Masters are men raised to the highest power, and whether they are embodied or disembodied, they work on this plane of life. A master can go in and out at will. No, I am not going to tell the world how they do it. Some who are not masters might try the experiment and not be able to go back again. Knowledge is power. But there are certain powers which may be dangerous if put in practice without a corresponding degree of wisdom. All human beings have in them the potentiality of mastership. That ought to be an encouragement to men and women who aspire to an intensity of life beyond that of the ordinary. But the attainment of mastership is a steady and generally a slow growth. My teacher here is a master. There are teachers here who are not masters, as there are teachers on earth who have not the rank of professor. But he who is willing to teach what he knows is on the right road. I do not mind saying that my teacher approves of my trying to tell the world something about the life which follows the change that is called death. If he disapproved, I should bow to a superior wisdom. No, it does not matter what his name is. I have referred to him simply as my teacher and have told you many things which he has said and done. Many other things I have not told you for I can only come occasionally now. After a time, I shall probably cease to come altogether. Not that I shall have lost interest in you, but it seems to be the plan that I shall get farther away from the world to learn things which necessitate for their comprehension a certain loosening of the earthly tie. Later, I may return again for the second time, but I make no promises. I will come if I can, and if it seems wise to come, and if you were in the mood to let me. I do not believe that I shall come through anybody else, at least not to write letters like this. I should probably have to put some such person through the same training process that I put you through, and few, even of those who are my friends and associates, would trust me to that extent. So even after I am gone, do not shut the door too tight in case I should want to come again, for I might have something immensely important to say. But on the other hand, please refrain from calling me, because if you should call me, you might draw me away from important work or study somewhere else. I do not say for certain that you could, but it is possible. And when I leave the neighborhood of the earth of my own accord, I do not wish to be drawn back until I am ready to return. The person still upon the earth may call so intensely to a friend who has passed away from the earth's atmosphere that that soul will come back too soon in response to the eager cry. Do not forget the dead, unless they are strong enough to be happy without your remembrance. But do not lean too heavily upon them. The masters of whom I spoke a little while ago can remain near or far away as they will. They can respond or not respond. But the ordinary soul is very sensitive to the call of those it loved on earth. I have seen a mother respond eagerly to the tearful prayer of a child, and yet unable to make the lonely one realize her presence. Sometimes the mothers are very sad because they cannot make their presence felt. One time I saw my teacher by his power help a mother to make herself seen and heard by a daughter who was in great trouble. The heart of my teacher is very soft to the sufferings of the world, and though he says that he is not one of the Christs, yet he often seems to work as Christ works. At other times he is all mind. He illustrates the saying about the thrice greatest Hermes Trismegistus, great in body, great in mind, great in heart. I wish I could tell you more about my teacher, but he does not wish to be too well known on earth. He works for the work's sake and not for reward or praise. He is very fond of children, and one day when I was sitting unseen in the house of a friend of mine on earth and the little son of the house fell down and hurt himself and wept bitterly, 
my great teacher, whom I have seen command literally legions of angels, bent down in his tenuous form, which he was then wearing, and soothed and comforted the child. When I asked him about it afterwards, he said that he remembered many childhoods of his own in other lands, and that he could still feel in memory the sting of physical pain and the shock of a physical fall. He told me that children suffer more than their elders realize, that the bewilderment felt in gradually adjusting to a new and frail and growing body is often the cause of intense suffering. He said that the constant crying of small babies is caused by their half-discouragement at the Herculean task before them, the task of molding a body through which their spirit can work. He told me a story of one of his former incarnations before he became a master, and what a hard struggle he had to build a body. He could remember even the smallest details of that faraway life. One day his mother punished him for something which he had not really done, and when he denied this supposed wrongful act she chided him for untruthfulness, not realizing, good woman though she was, the essential truth of the soul to whom she had given form. He told me that from that childhood impression centuries ago he could date his real battle against injustice which had helped to develop him as a friend and teacher of mankind. Then he went on to speak of the importance of our recovering the memories of other lives in order that we may see the roads by which our souls have come. As a rule, the great teachers are reticent about their own past, and they only refer to it when some point in their experience can be used to illustrate a principle and thus help another to grasp the principle. It encourages a groping soul to know that one who has attained a great height has been through the same trials that now perplex him. Letter 47. Only a Song. Will you listen to another song or chant or whatever you choose to call it of that amazing angel whom we know as the beautiful being? Why do you fear to question me? I am the great answerer of questions. Though my answers are often symbols, yet words themselves are only symbols. I have not visited you for a season, for when I am around you can think of nothing else, and it is well that you should think of those who have trodden the path you are treading. You can pattern your ways on those of others. You can hardly pattern your ways on mine. I am a light in the darkness. My name you do not need to know. A name is a limitation, and I refuse to be limited. In the ancient days of the angels, I refuse to enter the forms of my own creation, except to play with them. There is a hint for you if you like hints. He who is held by his own creation becomes a slave. That is one of the differences between me and men. What earthly father can escape his children? What earthly mother wishes to? But I, I can make a rose bloom, then leave it for another joy. My joy was in making. It would be dull for me to stay with the rose until its petals fell. The artist who can forget his past creations may create greater and greater things. The joy is in the doing, not in the holding fast to that which is done. Oh, the magic of letting go. It is the magic of the gods. There are races of men to whom I have revealed myself. They worship me. You need not worship me, for I do not require worship. That would be to limit myself to my own creations if I needed anything from the souls I have touched with my beauty. Oh, the magic of letting go. The magic of holding on. Yes, there is a magic to holding on to a thing until it is finished and perfect. But when a thing is finished, whether it be a poem, a love, or a child, let it go. In that way, you are free again and may begin another. It is the secret of eternal youth. Never look back with regret. Look back only to learn what is behind you. I look forward always. It is only when a man ceases to look forward to things that he begins to grow old. He settles down. I have said to live in the moment. That is the same thing seen from another side. The present and the future are playfellows. We do not play when we study the past. I am the great playfellow of men. You have been listening to Classic Paranormal's reading of Letters from a Living Dead Man by Elsa Barker. This was the fourth installment. Be sure to click into the succeeding episodes until the book is complete. Until then, followers of the freaky, aficionados of the afterworldly, connoisseurs of the creepy, stay spooky. Before you go, consider subscribing to my new podcast, Classic Paranormal. It's a clearinghouse for lost real-life accounts of true ghost stories. It's found on Apple Podcasts, 
Go there now if you're interested in enigmatic tales, chilling true accounts, chronicles from cases of the past that time has forgotten, but that the modern person who likes relaxing by a campfire swapping ghost stories might appreciate. As I said, the new podcast I'm launching is available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and there's a link in the description below on this video.